what I really wanted to why I really wanted to talk about this interview actually is because I don't remember what I actually said. So I wanted to react to it to see if I actually agree with my own opinions from back then because we filmed this such a long time ago, like months and months and months ago. I almost forgot about it because you know most of these things they like film it and then it doesn't come out until like a year later. So even when it came out, I was like, oh yeah, damn, I did do this. Um, it came out such a long time ago. So it'll be good to to see what I said and to see if like I still think that way um, or I still have those opinions. But it was, it was essentially around kind of like being a fashion journalist, but also being a YouTuber. And if fashion is respected, if fashion respects YouTubers or online creators. So anyway, let's get straight into it and let's see what I was talking about in this in this interview. Hi, my name is Odomayo Ojo. I'm a freelance fashion journalist and content creator. And my name is Tora Northman. I currently work at High Snobiety as the senior senior social media manager and I also do content creation on the side. So what about like with creating content on YouTube? How did you feel like obviously when you first started it I bet it was kind of tricky to like find your community versus now how what's the evolution been like yeah I think because I went into making YouTube content with this understanding that this content doesn't exist so there might not even be an audience for it right so I guess my motivations for doing it was just if I get 10 views and there's 10 people that are really interested that's really cool I didn't expect it to like go to where it went mm -hmm. to so to be honest I think that audience. This is so true. So to add context to what I just said in terms of like when I was starting um, fashion, YouTube fashion, I didn't really know if there would be an audience for it. It's so true because when I started my channel and before this channel that you're actually watching this on, I had a different channel and then I kind of rebranded it into the fashion archive and then it later became fashion roadman, right? But when I initially started, especially from the first channel, the kind of content I make actually did not exist. Like, there were people who I used to follow who I thought made really good content, like Sanjeev, like Magnus Ronning, like Fernando Rangel. I'm trying to think of who else. Avery Ginsberg in the earlier days. Um, Kyron Warwick, who I still watch today. But a lot of their content was more predicated on, like, styling having a fashion brand, all that sort of stuff. I was more, because I was more theoretical with the way I thought about fashion. So I was more into reading fashion critics. Like I used to read Tim Blanks and Kathy Horan and, you know, all these journalists, Vanessa Friedman, all these people. And so I was like, I watch all these YouTubers on YouTube. Why is it that no one kind of does what Tim Blanks does for all these magazines like Fantastic Man or now what he does at BOF. Why is it that no one does that but on YouTube? Why is it that when people make fashion content, it's either styling things or it's like vlogs? Like at the time, it was really popular to go to Supreme Drops or to do those kind of things. And I always, it always confused me. Like I thought maybe it was like there was just something there was like something wrong with, um, I don't know, like maybe people just didn't think it would work or whatever. And so the only time that I saw that kind of content was really Show Studio. I think Show Studio was the only platform on YouTube where you could actually go and it's a panel. Back then it was Lou Stoppard. You'd have people like Finn McTaggart. And they would actually talk about the runway shows and have these panels with industry experts. And you would actually feel like you were learning about the runway shows themselves and about the stories behind the designers' work and what they did. Um, and then, of course, even kind of like show studio time before show studio, there was also um, style.com. Style.com, where you would have Tim Blanks, who would go to the runway shows, and they used to post this on YouTube. Like, you can find all this stuff on YouTube. Luke is saying in the comments, Mima, yeah. Mima Veglizio, uh, she was amazing on Show Studio, by the way. Um, and so, with Style, 
Star.com, Tim Blanks would go, he would analyze the show, he would also interview people that were at the show. Um, but I just, to be honest, I just used to watch it to see what Tim Blanks would say because you don't, when they interview people at shows, and it kind of reminds me of kind of what Luke Pigeon does now, where well, I love his videos, but sometimes when I, I love Luke Pigeon's videos because Luke Pigeon will interview the designer and he's a journalist, so he'll get the information from the designer and then the information is really key. Like, you'll get inf- nuggets of information that you can't find otherwise. But then the people that he interviews, like, what did you think of the show? Oh, great, fantastic, bubbly, awesome. And they just say a, a whole bunch of fluff. And that was the same issue that I had with style.com at the time when they would interview anyone other than Tim Blanks. It would just be like, what did you think of the collection? Oh my God, it was, it was sensational. I mean, I mean, this is fashion at its peak. I mean, this is fashion that is, that is moving and shaking, that's dancing and, and, and jumping. And it's like, so what? <laughs> so like, what, what am I supposed to learn from that? Um, but yeah, so kind of going back to what I was saying, style.com, show studio, those were the only two. So At the time when I made my video, I had my videos and I made my channel, I had absolutely no idea where it would go. I had no idea if there was an audience for it. I just wanted to do it because I watched so much fashion YouTube and I just wanted to talk about my interest on YouTube because I watch other people's interests on YouTube and I just thought it made a lot of sense at the time. So that's why going back to this BFC interview, I was like, yeah, I didn't know if there'll be an audience, if there were literally 10 people who watched my videos and, you know, had something interesting to comment, I'd be happy because genuinely I had no idea if there was even an audience for that. Audience has kind of just created itself. I think fashion in general is more popular now. I think now more than ever, people are actually more interested in runaway shows and brands that people never talked about before. When I started my channel, Scaparelli, for example, was a like no one talked about it unless you're into fashion history. Totally. But now you have, you know, designers like Daniel Rosebury bringing it back. So, oh my God. So, this is how I know that discourse online has changed. Like the, pe- the audience, or let's say there's just a bigger audience for the, this kind of content now, like fashion essays, fashion analysis, blah, blah, blah. When I, um, made my channel people didn't even know that there was a difference between Martin Magella and Maison Magella like people used to say they used to refer to Martin as Maison Magella because they didn't even know that Maison meant like house of like house of Magella like when you say Maison Magella that's house of Magella that was how new the audience for this kind of content was when I first started making content if you talked about designers like Scaparelli people had no idea what I was talking about. I remember early, early days, I used to do live streams where I'll talk about like different designers historically that have done really interesting things and people just didn't know what I was talking about. Whereas I feel like now, if I do a Scaparetti stream, everyone knows what I'm talking about. If I do a, I don't know, Chris Bob Balenciaga stream, everyone knows what I'm talking about. So th- this is how I know for a fact that, <laughs> the fashion discourse online has changed drastically. It's like so different. So, so different. I think actually in general, people are having more conversations about fashion. So I think the timing, even yeah. though I didn't plan it that way, was kind of perfect. Yeah, you came into it right <laughs> when it needed to be done. Um, do you feel like it was well received within the fashion community, like being on YouTube and doing social media? Uh, not at first, no. Yeah. Period. I think that it wasn't taken seriously i think there's this big separation between like real journalists and then youtubers so it was this thing where yeah this guy's like cool but he's not like a real journalist he's not doing real journalism type of thing and there was a lot of gatekeepy perspectives around it yeah um which is funny because from where i was sitting i was like well there is no space for me in the fashion industry at the time we had you know alexandra shulman and her British Vogue and that picture that came out at the yeah. time and everyone was white. So clearly 
there was no space for me in like the fashion journalism realm. So I had to create my own space in a way. Um, so that perspective of, you know, it's not real journalism at first is kind of funny because now every single traditional journalist I see, they all have social media platforms. Now they've all realized that first of all, the pay isn't great. And secondly, it's actually a good idea to make your own audience. So it's funny yeah. how they've gone from being like, this is weird, this is strange. These people aren't doing real journalism to following the same blueprint that we created. It's kind of funny. A thousand. So <laughs> that's kind of like a hot take that I dropped in there. But what I was essentially saying is that I remember, and it, it's not even I remember this, even till now, this still happened. Um, Till I, as recently as last year, I went to this fashion event and I went with like some highly esteemed journalists. I won't say their names, obviously. I'm not trying to get anyone into trouble. This is not like a drama channel or whatever. But um, I was just there and we went for dinner and all these journalists started complaining about the fact that, oh, um... <laughs> I hate that influencers are taking over and influencers are, you know, at the front seats of the shows. And I just hate where fashion has gone. And like, these designers are so ungrateful. I covered their brand when they were small brands. And now that they're too big for their boots, they don't put us on the front row anymore. They're putting these mindless influencers, which I agree with them in a sense. Um, but then I think. One time I was at dinner and I don't think the person actually realized I was there. And they mentioned, they started mentioning like names of um, people that are at front rows at shows and why they don't like it. And they mentioned my name. They mentioned Bliss Foster's name. They mentioned Hort Mode's name. And I was just thinking to myself, like, first of all, this journalist that is talking, if I was to just... If my YouTube channel disappeared today and we just said, okay, let's compare writing resumes. I've written for the business of fashion. I worked there for nine months. I've written for Vogue Runway. I've written for GQ. This person doesn't even have the writing credentials that I have. And they're, they're trying to be shady and refer to me as, oh, he's just a, a mindless YouTuber and he gets to go at the front row of shows and I don't. Like, fashion is going downhill. And I was so confused because I was like, even as a writer, you're not even where I am as a writer, not to talk of the content stuff. And I think that what, what I'm, the bigger point I'm making is that I genuinely think that a lot of journalists, they, there's like a personal inadequacy that they felt because they felt like their opinions were not less valid, but it didn't get as much visibility as the time when social media didn't exist and everyone had to buy the magazine to get the opinion. And so they're kind of butthurt that, <laughs> they're kind of butthurt that the realm has just expanded. And I think that they're just not smart because if they were smart, they would have started social media platforms or YouTube platforms like me and they would be more successful than me because they have more knowledge than me. Like, can you imagine? And by the way, um, my favorite journalists weren't the people saying this. It was other journalists that I won't mention, but it wasn't, uh, I don't know, Rachel Tashjian or uh, Kathy Horan or whatever saying this about me. So it's not them. But just as an example, can you imagine if Tim Blanks started his own YouTube channel? Tim Blanks has been covering fashion since before I was born. I interviewed Tim Blanks um, when he wrote his Versace book about the book, and you guys can find that on the Thames and Hudson podcast um, platform. And he said that he's been to every single Donatella Versace show. Do you know how insane that is? Do you know how much knowledge Tim Blanks has? Like if Tim Blanks started his personal YouTube channel where he just started analyzing fashion and like talking about, his personal stories and giving the kind of context that me personally, I could never dream of giving that context because I'm not Tim Blanks. I'm not as experienced as Tim Blanks. I don't have the knowledge base that Tim Blanks does have. Um, so 
it's crazy. And I'm just using Tim Blanks as an example. But a lot of these journalists that, you know, were saying this stuff, why don't they do that? It would actually be better for them. And they would probably make more money too if they did that. Um, and so I just think that sometimes a lot of people in fashion, they just like to be, they just like to hate on people because they can see that the power and their grasp on, you know, fashion media was waning. And therefore, they just use it as a chance to hate on everything else that's alternative that they see. And it happens in droves. I remember when people were saying that the same thing about fashion bloggers, even fashion bloggers that literally had whole ass brands that were successful and stocked in the likes of Barney's and they were journalists in their own rights and writing for big magazines and then they decide to blog like a good example of that is Diane Pernay. Diane Pernay had a very successful fashion brand. She was a journalist for some of the top magazines, especially in France. And she became a fashion blogger. And then when she became a fashion blogger and she made a shaded view of fashion, this is like fashion law. I'm going deep. But when she made a shaded view of fashion, people started to do that same thing. Oh, bloggers, you know, they're not serious, blah, 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 because these journalists could see that the power was waning from, you know, their hands. And they tried to lump Diane Pernay in that same group is exactly what they did with the YouTube thing. They're going to do the same thing with TikTokers, even people like Ryan Finn. And Ryan Finn is smarter than 95% of journalists I know that work in fashion right now at all the magazines. But they're going to do the same thing with Ryan Finn because they just, they're so mad that they don't have the same grasp on the fashion zeitgeist that people like Ryan Finn do. Um, so yeah, but anyway, let's continue the interview. Let me not go in too deep. And I think a lot of it also comes from almost like this element of insecurity and fashion has always kind of rejected the new or it's always been kind of slow to adapt, I've found at least, because like social media has been a thing for, for quite a yeah. long time. And when you look at like the old days of, of bloggers and when they started being taken seriously in the industry, that wasn't until like a couple of years ago, but they've been around since, I don't know, like 2010. I remember reading like Brian Boy's blog and following him and his journey. <laughs> And it took years for him to be taken seriously within fashion. So I don't really understand why we're still repeating this like cycle. Or I, we, we are not, clearly, because yeah. social media is, <laughs> is the shit. Sorry, I don't know if I can swear on this. But uh, <laughs> I, I do think it's so important. And you're so right. Now everyone is looking to social media. Every single publication is taking social media super seriously. And that's kind of what made me shift from being an editor and writing because I never actually intended to become a writer. It kind of just happened, fell into it, was never my dream to just write. I've always enjoyed like the 360, the content creation perspective. So when I got the opportunity to do that, I was on it immediately. And my task was essentially to launch a TikTok channel for Heist Nabiety, which is a publisher and it's a media company. And you know we do so many, so many different things and actually saying, oh yeah, let's do TikTok right. is so, cool in a way because i think we were also a bit earlier than a couple of brands but for that to be taken seriously like in a workplace especially i think it's great because it's so rare and now we're in what 2024 tiktok's been around for years there's still so many brands that are not on tiktok they don't understand the platform like i speak to people all the time and their response is like oh i'm not on tiktok like i don't want another social media i will just get so <laughs> distracted or like all of these things and i'm like what do you mean this is this is it. Um, and I can imagine that's very similar for you. Yeah, and it's, it's like history repeats itself over again. So we had the bloggers who weren't taken seriously. They had to fight for their space in the industry. Then it was like the YouTube era, and we all had to fight. And then on TikTok, the same thing. And it's just at that point, this has happened how many times now? The writing is on the wall, but then the fashion industry is still slow to adapt and is still like, you don't understand TikTok and now everyone's like scurrying and hustling, trying to understand and be involved. It's a bit strange that it has to happen that many times and people still don't, you know, understand it. Yeah. And I also think that uh, just to touch on that uh, fashion being slow to adapt thing, because I think was it Day that said um, like Day, you don't agree with the um, like fashion is slow to adapt. I think fashion is slow to adapt in the sense that 
they hop on things too late. Like brands hop on things way too late. So for example, when TikTok was like blowing up and everyone was saying like consultants and all the people that, you know, know what's going on were saying brands should join TikTok. Like there's this thing happening on TikTok. Like brands should get involved. Brands should do this, brands should do that. And all the brands were just like, nah, TikTok just looks like a place where like cringy kids dance. So it's not very luxe to be on that platform. But then a few brands did it and then they saw so much success and then all the other brands were like, oh no, we need a TikTok. Look at what this brand did on TikTok. And da, da, da. then they all adapt. Like they never just do it or take the chance or take the risk when people like the consultants or, you know, the insiders are telling them, oh, this is the next big thing. They will wait until it's like a, they will wait until it's the most established thing in the world and then they'll hop on it late and then see no benefit and then be like, see, this is why we didn't do it. It doesn't work. And that's been my experience consulting for a lot of fashion brands or um, working under a lot of fashion brands. They will not do the things when they're supposed to do it. You'll tell them to do something. They'll do it a few months later when they've convinced themselves to do it or they've seen everything work, which by the time everything has worked on a platform, it's probably too late to be joining it um, as a brand. And so that's what we mean when it's like slow to adapt in that sense. But you don't necessarily need social media to succeed as a brand or you don't need these things. But if they're trying to use these things, then it's best to use it in a way where you're hopping onto things at the right time. You're immersing yourself into communities when you should be immersing yourself or or in a way that it doesn't look like you're just leeching you're actually part of the community all these things i think fashion struggles with this or fashion brands struggle with these things the thing you know publications and and brands are also looking for creators now to help them with the video content to help them with this like gen z oriented content because a lot of people in businesses are are older like they're millennials, they're 30 plus, you know, they're not on TikTok consuming content in the same way that their target audiences would be per se. So they have to look elsewhere and they have to find these like cool TikTokers who are making content. Um, and because you can blow up overnight and with YouTube as well, they have no idea. Um, so I think it's really cool to see now that that's being more integrated in like their workflow and they're, they're looking at incorporating that into their advertising, their communications, like it is, because it is so important. Like yeah. everyone's on social media. And if we can, you know, put all this money into producing a really glossy, nice campaign for a magazine, you will never be able to tell how many people saw your ad. You can look at how many people bought your magazine. Right. But if you go on YouTube, you can see how many people watched it, how long they watched it for, how many people comment, how many people like same on TikTok, like the insights are there, the research is there for you. So I think it's so interesting to see like, it's slowly becoming a thing, but I think it's yeah. also scary, scary for brands. I think it's also difficult because it's this idea of building community. And I think a lot of, let's say brands or magazines, they find it really difficult building those because if you think- Oh, before I make the point, I can't remember what point I made, but brands struggle so heavily with building a community because I've noticed that it's kind of like corporate speak now. And it's not just in the fashion industry. It's every corporate company, I guess. They're all talking about, you know, it's all about community building. I genuinely don't think any of them know what that means. I think they think that community building is having all these like wacky ass phrases that become catch terms for the brand. And, it's, and then they have like, you know, events every three months where they invite vips and it's like yeah we're building a an authentic community like that is not how you build an authentic community <laughs> they they just don't get it and so it's funny when brands use that as a buzz term in fashion it's like you know we're just building communities and it's all about community building and and it's so funny <laughs> exactly what uh funny bibs is saying like knowing your core audience and <laughs> it's so funny you think about something like vogue before the social media age mm. it's just the vogue editors write what they write as fact and that's it and you just have to read it 
you can't even comment anywhere, yeah. you can't give your opinion. If I make a video about a runway show, if people disagree, they'll let me know. Um, people have their own conversations in the comment section, and I also learn a lot from them. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not in a bubble, there are people who comment who work in the industry too. Some people might even work for the brand, some people might have even worked on that specific show. Right. Um, and you get so much more context um, when you use social media platforms in a way that you didn't before the social media age. And it's also democratized fashion in a way that we hadn't seen before. There was a very singular perspective on fashion, yeah. but because of social media, you can talk to someone like I started making content on my bed, literally when I was in uni. Right. Um, and you wouldn't have, you know, someone who with no money and no connections talking about fashion on their bed and achieving any success if it wasn't for social media. Yeah. No, for sure. And the idea of community is so important, I think, because like you say, so many people engage and interact and they also find friends through social media and they find the people like like minded people. Because for me, growing up in Hong Kong, honestly, there wasn't a big fashion community whatsoever. And I was looking at kids in London, you know, queuing up outside Supreme, like looking at YouTube and seeing this like whole community of people that became friends through fashion. And even then it was, you know, like on Instagram, maybe it was like the glory age of fit pics. And I started posting on my Instagram, even though I had no friends that were doing it. I was like doing it on my work break and like all my colleagues to like, take a little photo of me and I was like so embarrassed but I was also a kid I was like 19 years old and the world was my oyster and I think the confidence that you have at that age also when you see other kids talking about what you like like on the internet I was like I'm unstoppable like I don't care what these people say that have like authority like I, I've read magazines my whole life and I've you know studied Vogue and you know done all these things but once I realized that like maybe that's not you don't have to follow that 100 percent like maybe you can form your own opinion maybe you can have discussions with your friends that opened a whole new world and that's because of social media and i think so many people now also on tiktok is a great example you watch a show like take the margella couture show i saw hundreds of videos on my tiktok and on my youtube and on my instagram of people just sharing their own opinions mm -hmm. and their thoughts and questions around that show in a way that I, I, I don't see very often. And I feel like that's happening a lot more now on social media that people are just like, yeah, I, I'll share my opinion. I have 30 followers, but like, who cares? Someone might see it and you connect through that. I'm like, that sounds so deep, but it, it is really like that. You find your friends, you no, find your community. It, it definitely is. And it's also very authentic because let's say a lot of the industry, they're beholden to brands because those are their advertisers. Those are the sponsors. So you actually cannot be critical about mm -hmm. any of these brands. But on social media, you can. I can say, you know, the latest so-and-so brand show, I don't like it and give loads of reasons. And it's not going to affect me in any way because they yeah. don't sponsor me in the first place. So they're not going to take money away from me. Um, but you can't do that if you're a magazine and they're your advertisers because there could be very serious repercussions to actually saying negative things. So that's another thing about social media, because before social media, fashion was kind of this utopia of just going by what fashion journalists say as Bible and as, you know, just what is fact. Yeah. Whereas now with social media, there are way more perspectives and there's, I think, more of a critical eye on fashion that there wasn't before. Mm -hmm. And so. OK, and so my point on. um. Because I don't think many people are discerning to this fact that, and I, I don't want to mention names necessarily. Um, you know, I don't want to mention names, but you have to look at who works with what brand, who is sponsored by what brand, what brands have paid this person, what brands pay this magazine, and then you have to go from there. because. Sometimes, you know, people take all these opinions from someone who is literally on the payroll of a certain brand. And so there's a conflict of interest if they're analyzing a collection, but then this is the same brand that's like paying them loads of money. There's not really much to get from there. Or it's very obvious that they can't say anything negative or they can't be critical in any way. So there's definitely going to be information that you can take from it and valuable information that you can take from it sometimes, but you have to go 
into those situations with that understanding that that's kind of this situation that we're in. Where I'm listening to someone analyzing a Chanel show who is on Chanel's payroll. Like that's kind of how you have to look at it. I, th- I think a lot of people sometimes don't even consider these things when they read a magazine or when they read a certain journalist's work or when they look at a certain content creator and like the content they're making. Um, so yeah. So many more voices as well. Whereas I think before it used to always come from the same group or the same type of people. And I think now there's so much more like opinion and more life experiences that can like share yeah. their opinions, which I think is so important because that really allows you to understand the 360 around like a fashion show, an article, a collection and whatnot. Because I think I learned so much and I spend hours on social media because <laughs> it's work, but also because it's like, I, I enjoy it. Yeah. I do it in my free time. I do it for work. I'm on Twitter for hours a day, just looking at like random fashion threads. People post archive photos and I'm, I'm learning so much every day just from these random people on the internet who don't even have like, I don't even know who they are. They just have like a little name and I follow them for years and they just post all this content and I, I eat it up. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I think the same with, same with YouTube as well. Like I sp- spend hours just looking at things, listening to people, what they think, even if I don't agree, I think just finding perspective is so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. And I, I just, yeah, I think it's just very interesting that we've, we've gone to, you know, social media people being at the front row, which is a big conversation now mm-hmm. that people are having online. Whereas like, should you give journalists who were the ones that covered these designers from Okay, so I didn't even realise that I, in this interview, I actually talked about that whole thing of, you know, journalists complaining. Obviously, I didn't go deep into it the way I did in the stream, where exactly what was said um, and all that sort of stuff. Um, So I didn't actually realise that I actually talked about journalists not being happy with the fact that their seats are being taken by people with online platforms. But anyway, let's, let's continue. From the start the front row or should you give content creators because they have the the vision and they get the eyeballs and stuff like that and there's like this big fight between um the old guard of fashion journalists and then the new school sort of like content creators yeah turn journalists um and there's a lot of friction between it which is kind of funny it is funny to watch i think there has to be like a happy medium because i do think obviously the people that have been working in the industry for a really, really long time, have a lot of, you know, historical knowledge. They have been around for a while. They can reference old shows that they went to and whatnot. But I also understand that, like, the currency of today is virality. Like, if you don't have the views, the the right people, people forget about things, you know, like 24 hours after they've happened. And it's about, like, creating that viral moment on social media by, like, having the Kylie Jenners, the Kim Kardashians, you know, because you know that every magazine, not just fashion magazines, are going to cover it. So your brand is going to get this massive, massive exposure. And same with TikTokers, with YouTubers, with content creators. They have a massive following and a massive community that I, I think it really opens up your brand to like this whole new audience, especially of Gen Z consumers. Whereas I think, you know, the old school fashion journalists, like the publications, they still need to be in the space, they need to be able to see the collection, um, not being like in the fourth row, trying to like, oh, sorry, what was that shoe? Um, And I know like from my personal experience, like going to shows to write about them versus doing content at shows, like I'm insufferable. I'm there and like my arm is up and I'm like trying to, I'm I'm, like, I need to get the content. Uh, And it's, that's just, it's the reality and that's how it's changed. Because like you need to get those celebrity videos, you need to get like the cool street style yep. shots, yep. Like, and that's just that's just how it's naturally evolved. I don't think it's good or bad. I I just think that's like where it's gotten to now. Yeah. I don't know. How, how do you feel about that? What I will say is I'm so. Oh, let me not freeze my frame of my face looking crazy oh. like that. Yeah, we can pause it there. Um, what I was gonna say is I'm so happy that my um, content is not predicated on having to talk about a celebrity. Do I talk about celebrities sometimes? Yes. Will I talk about some of them in the future? Yes. 
But I don't know, like having to film celebrities and just talk about and obsess over celebrities 24 seven constantly, I would hate for that to be my existence in general. Um, So I'm quite happy that, you know, a lot of my content isn't predicated about that. I probably would make more money and I probably would be more famous and my (laughs) platform would be a lot bigger if I did more of that. But that just isn't really me. And at the end of the day, like you have to be authentic. People can see when you're being inauthentic, like people are not stupid. Um, yeah, I think, cause some of my favorite journalists, like I always want them to be in the front row and yeah, to see. So like people like, I don't know, Kathy Horan or Tim Blanks or Vanessa Friedman, totally. um, Rachel Tastian, like these kind of people, amazing journalists, amazing writers. Um, I hope they always have the front row because I always love to read everything that they write. Exactly. Um, like you said, it's kind of like a happy medium. It's kind of like a balance of both. Mm-hmm. Um, you can get the traditional, like old school journalists alongside the new TikTokers and YouTubers and stuff like that. Um, and it's like a happy medium, sort of everyone wins. Yeah. Um, but- so yeah, this is the thing that I... But now- let me just not put my face crazy like that again. Um, this is the thing that I don't understand. Because like I just said, um, you can find, like brands could find a happy medium with getting the best of the best writers like a Kathy Horan or a Tim Blanks because genuinely there's so much to learn from what they say. So definitely put those in the front row and then mix it with, you know, super famous high engagement tiktokers or whatever content creators on instagram who will push millions of impressions to these brands which is and both of them are good for the business in my opinion and so there should be a happy medium what i don't understand about the old school journalists and the old guard going back to the dinner i had with a lot of these people they're they don't even they're not trying to find a happy medium and it's almost like they don't understand economics in the fact that some of these journalists, no one is reading. No one is reading what you write, but the TikToker or the Instagrammer gets millions of impressions. So, as a business, what do you think will bring more visibility to your brand? Um, and then there's a different kind of visibility from a very well-respected journalist that people do read, like a Tim Blanks, which a lot of these journalists are nowhere near the level of someone like that, or a Kathy Horan or a Van- Vanessa Friedman. And so, I think there should be a happy medium. But I think. A lot of these people that are just like, none of them should be there and all that stuff. I just think <laughs> they have issues. Now it just seems to be either or that brands do, which I think is what is creating the friction yeah. in the first place. I was just like, you guys aren't relevant. Let's bring the TikTokers, which I don't necessarily agree with. I think it should be a mixture. Totally. And I think the longevity is also different. Like, obviously, the TikTok content is very current. It's very in the moment that people are going to see it. But, you know, an article can live on forever. People are going to reference that years from now. And I think maybe the solution is that we can all learn from each other. Because I also find a lot of the times, like, old school school journalists also need to learn more about social media and its influence on fashion. Because I think you forget that there is this whole world of consumers that have no in to fashion. They might just, like, like clothes. And then one day they'll, like, see this cool video on TikTok of someone talking about this brand they've never heard of. Yeah. And then it opens up this whole new world. So it's a very like nice entry level. Whereas I think now a lot of content is behind paywalls. Like it's not super accessible to especially young people. Whereas, you know, social media is accessible. It's free. You can you can use it and you can my favorite thing is when people like screenshot articles and post them on Twitter for everyone. The, oh my God. So she just made a really good point. Uh that is a big issue in fashion. The fact that a lot of um, content is behind a paywall. Um, so, you know, the fact that, you know, with magazines, a lot of magazines actually, uh, you have to get like 10 million subscriptions. You have to get the Women's Wide Daily subscription. You have to get the, the Financial Times subscription. You have to get the New York Times subscription. You have to get the Business of Fashion subscription. And by the end of it, like... <laughs> you're basically broke like you have all this information but you're broke so i think we need to find a medium with all of that stuff like vogue business that's another subscription everyone to read because i'm like yes that that's community i Be- love it it's, it's kind of illegal but no one it actually is. gets into but trouble you know for I mean? it yeah. because it's like these are kids like 
having them pay a subscription like I, I get it like everyone has to make their money but also like I don't know I, I'm so torn I'm it's <laughs> it it's a tricky one because I just think it should be accessible for everyone that wants to enjoy and consume fashion because that's how I grew up and like you say like reading all of these reviews and reading all of this writing from these amazing journalists it sucks when that's behind a paywall oh you're completely right I mean some of my favorite books I found like random PDFs of them online. And if I was to buy them, like the Raf Simmons Redux book, I found some PDF like years ago and like read the book. But if you were to buy it, it costs like 400 euros. Exactly. I didn't have 400 euros to buy one book. No. So that's the thing. It's like these things, even though once again, I don't know, like the copyright laws is yeah. not great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, don't speak to me about that. I don't know. <laughs> But it's it's like that kids need to be able to access these things yeah. to really be engaged with these brands. Yeah. I think that's a big reason why I'm engaged with these brands, because I was able to find places I could read about these designers mm -hmm. without a paywall. And it is kind of sad that money is a limiting factor for information for a lot of kids that yeah. are interested in fashion these days. Totally. Um, so <laughs> funny thing, actually, because I basically exposed the fact that when I was getting into fashion when I was younger, I used to download PDFs of books instead of buying them. Um, by the way, that's that's not illegal, by the way. You, me downloading them is not the illegal thing. It's the distribution of them that is illegal. So I, no one, I think someone in the comments said that, oh, you need to be careful by exposing yourself. Like, no one cares. Trust me. Nothing's going to happen. Um... <laughs> If I if I was, you know, distributing these things all over the place, then yes, it's different. Um, but yeah, it's such a it's such a limiting factor because as much as we say, you know, people need to do research and da, 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 is the research accessible to these people, right? Um and so that's that's a big issue. That's even why, like, even when I do have a paywall, like Patreon, I'm not I know some people whose Patreon is like a like $50. I know someone whose Patreon is even $100, which is to me insane. Uh, like not affordable at all for most people. So I also try to make it affordable. Um, Cause yeah, it's tough. It's rough out here. It's not easy. It's not easy. And some of these subscriptions are mad expensive. Like what was the website I wanted to join? There was a website, I think it was one of those like financial times or whatever. And I had just gotten so tired of like trying to bypass the paywall all the time. I was like, you know what? Let me just pay for it. Let me see how much it costs. And it costs so much money. I was like, wait, is this how much it actually costs for just one platform? And if I say I want to pay for every single platform this exact same way, I will literally be paying like a thousand dollars a year on subscriptions. That is wild. A thousand dollars a year is wild. Like that is insanity. Totally. And that's why I feel like it's so important, like you say, when these journalists realize that social media is a big thing. Like Vanessa Friedman's always posting live on Twitter from shows. And I think that's a really nice entry point for people to still experience and, and hear her opinion without being able to maybe read some of the articles. So you still get a chunk of it. But I don't know, like, I guess the monetization thing is also happening on social media with like Patreon and Twitch and whatnot. But I still feel like we haven't quite gotten there with fashion content. It's not really behind a paywall. So it is very like accessible yeah. on YouTube and yeah. TikTok um, and Instagram as well, obviously. Yeah. But I guess also the money in social media is really crazy. So I, I can really imagine like if you're already a journalist and you're already writing there's quite a lucrative oh i'm not there yet I, I mean people do make a lot of money on social media to be fair it really just depends on the views that you get and if you can use those views to get sponsorships the people that get loads of views and also get really good sponsorships yes they make loads of money am i in that boat no hopefully one day i'll be i'll be rich and i'll drive my porsche 911 <laughs> um but yeah industry to get into by like you know tiktok pays you for views so does youtube so like how do you navigate how do you navigate that that's like a an yeah it's, it's kind of like a, a strange balance because as a journalist most journalists don't get paid great mm. 
Um, but then you have expertise that would always work on social media if you know how to use it. Exactly. So that's the thing. It's like if you have the expertise, you can always pivot to social media. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, I guess, because yeah. obviously you were doing a lot of YouTube and now you do a lot of writing as well. Yeah. Was that always kind of the goal? Yeah, that was definitely the goal. Um, but once again, like I said earlier, I didn't really know how to get into the industry. So YouTube was my way to get into the mm -hmm. industry. And since then, I've studied fashion journalism at CSM, worked for all different magazines. Um, but I needed to take that route um, to actually be seen as someone that knows about fashion and knows what I'm talking about. Right. Um, which is kind of sad that I've had to like go all the way around just to get into the industry. Um, I hope in the future that people with talent can just be seen for their talent and they don't have to break five million barriers just to get, you know, some room in the industry. Yeah. Okay, so let me add context uh, to that opinion in terms of like me saying that there was no space for me in the fashion industry. So what I mean is when at the time, like I've said a zillion times now, I was doing a lot of design roles. I did fashion internships one of my internships i was making patterns um my first internship i was just doing everything i was a fly on the wall so my first internship i was like i hosted a show at the sachi gallery for the brand and then i would assist the creative director on doing lectures because at the time she was a lecturer at rca the royal college of art so people some of the fashion students i think they were doing their ma they would come into our design studio and she would like give lectures in a design studio and show them different design techniques and things like that and we also had a machinist who used to work at Balenciaga and then moved to our brand and so i was learning a lot from this machinist and so just learning all that stuff and during that time because i had the chance to do so many roles in fashion from hosting shows to doing pr to literally handling emails to you know making patterns to arranging patterns at first all these kind of different roles i started to over time try to think where if i had to stay in the fashion industry long term what would i enjoy what do i like the most and over just loads of time of just thinking and thinking i came to the you know conclusion that I like talking about fashion and I like writing about fashion. And when I started to think about that, I was like, okay, how do I get into the industry? Obviously, the biggest magazine is British Vogue at the time. There were absolutely no people of color working at British Vogue. So I was like, well, that's not going to happen. And I remember other magazines I thought were kind of cool and trendy and like unique at the time, like the likes of Dazed, ID. I would always like disturb editors and ask them like, is there any opportunity for, you know, me to um, write or is there any opportunity like here's my writing, um, all that sort of stuff. And they just said no, which is fair enough. They didn't know who I was, whatever. I didn't have a strong portfolio. But at the end of the day, like they should be looking at what I've written. And they're like, the the vibe they gave me was like, we don't, have any proof that you know anything about fashion like who the hell are you so even when i was making um my youtube channel there was also like an air of yes that type of content didn't exist and i didn't know where it would go but i also wanted to use it as a portfolio so i'd have videos of me analyzing fashion and talking about fashion history and then i could you know show these editors oh this is actually some stuff i've done about fashion Blah, 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 blah. Um, so that was part of the reason why I did it also. And the funny, let me tell you guys a funny story. The funniest thing, this is how unintelligent people in fashion are or how people in fashion aren't actually good at their jobs. It's all about like uh, branding and how you position yourself. Can you believe that some of the first articles I did for big fashion magazines were the same articles I wrote years before because the, the topics were quite evergreen. They were the same articles I wrote two to three years before that moment that they rejected. The same exact editor rejected because they were like, this writing is just not on the level of blah, blah, blah. 
I don't like it, blah, blah, blah. But now all of a sudden, because you're someone that is, you know, doing interesting analysis of shows on YouTube and you're building a name for yourself, the exact same writing has gone from, it's not on the level, we don't like it, I don't understand it, blah, 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 all of a sudden it's magically good out of the sky by the same editor. That is like weird. And that's the weird thing about fashion. And that's why I say a lot of people in fashion are not fantastic at their jobs. Because if you are good at your job and you genuinely thought it wasn't to the level, if I submitted the same thing, you'd be like, isn't this the same thing you submitted? And even if you don't remember that, it just shouldn't be on the level, right? Why is it good? Why is it bad one day and then good another day? So that's the thing about fashion. Sometimes it's all about how people perceive you. It's about how an editor perceives you. It's how about how the CEO of a brand perceives you. It's about how the founders of these magazines perceive you, which determines what jobs you get, what roles you get, where you go. Um, it's not actually about how actually good of a writer you are, which to me is mind boggling. So yeah, funny, funny story. A thousand percent. And I think even if you do all the work, if you're young, people are still like, mm, <laughs> you got a lot to learn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think even that's a barrier. Like you say, there's just so many things that you have to go through. And I think even when you work in the industry, I always feel I have the worst imposter syndrome because I started when I was 18. And I think also people that are working in fashion are interested in social media. Like we get, I know that I get a lot of my ideas from things I'm seeing on Twitter, on TikTok, on YouTube. Like I'll see someone be talking about something and that will then go on to inspire this next piece that I'm working on. Um, and I do think people are really starting to understand that and they're starting to accept it as yeah. well, which I think is yeah. nice. Because um, again, we have a lot to learn from each other. And I hope that one day, I mean, my ideal scenario would be that all these fashion journalists that are writing could also deliver that in like a 30 second TikTok. Right, right. You know what I mean? Um, but I still think that gap is, is still huge. And I don't think that's going to like happen anytime soon. But at least the power of social media is definitely being recognized by a lot of brands. And because everyone's live streaming as well, their yeah. shows. And I think so many people are tuning in because it is just more accessible. And that's how you find your audience, I guess. Yeah, I do think there's still a few things that need to change because the industry we still gatekeep a lot of things like something i always talk about is show notes mm. immediately the show is over why not just post the show notes to your page or whatever and some brands do it True. rick owens is known for doing that in the youtube descriptions or all the show yeah. notes um but people actually want to learn about your brand people are actually interested yeah. and you're almost blocking people's interest into your own brand you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot as a brand and not making things like show notes available, different information, different yeah. press releases. So I still think the industry needs to catch up, um, but I feel like we'll get there with time. I hope. Yeah, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many things that the industry needs to catch up on. Like going back to what I said earlier, where I was like, I don't think that these luxury brands, especially a lot of brands talk about, or corporations, they talk about, oh, we need to build a community. It's, the new thing now is about community building, blah, blah, blah. Part of community building is bringing, and that's why I say these, these people don't have a clue. They don't know what they're talking about. Part of community building is bringing people in, letting people in. Like, that's how you build the community. People feel like they're part of something. They feel like they're, you know, involved in your brand in some way or another. So because all of these um, brands their whole thing is about exclusivity. They're built on exclusivity. You can't really build a community around that. You can build a snobbish group of people, but you can't build a community. So when they try to pivot back and forth, it doesn't make sense. Like even the show notes, most of the show notes for starters aren't even that insightful. You can't really learn anything valuable from them. But I just don't understand why brands gatekeep their own show notes. It makes no sense to me. It's literally stupid. It's like people want to learn about your brand. People are actually interested. Any extra information you can give them about the brand, people will love it. And actually, 
it, people will be able to reference your work later. People have a better understanding of your work, which might give them a closer tie to that collection, which might mean they might buy it. And so that's what I mean by a lot of fashion is behind. There's just a lot of things that they don't understand. And they say that they're about community building and they know how to build communities and all these things. And then you look at their actions and the things that they actually do. And then you see that they don't know what they're talking about. I hope so. I mean, I think there's, I like you say, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, but I think even with show notes and stuff, I think brands just maybe forget that there are so many people outside the people in that room that care and are fascinated, that are interested, that probably wouldn't be able to get into that room in a very long time, and but would die to be there. Like very like Devil Wears Prada, like a million girls would kill for this job, like <laughs> type mentality. But it is very much like, oh, and if you're a, a person on TikTok posting, you'll film your seat, here's what was happening, here's the invite, and people get that full experience because they wouldn't be going themselves. And I think that level of like relatability and people get to experience it through someone's lens instead of just seeing, you know, photos on Vogue Runway, which is also amazing, but you get to see the full 360 around a show through social media. Um, and even like the show notes thing is crazy. And I'm like, I want to see the set design. I want to see close-ups of the makeup. Like there's so many things and so much work that goes into a show and even collections in general that Facts. I just feel like we just get delivered a press release Facts. and images. And then Facts. that's kind of, that's kind of it. Facts. We want to know these things. Who is the makeup artist? Like, what was their idea? What was the idea behind the makeup? What was the idea behind the hair? We want to know these things. Like people are actually interested, you know? Like these brands act like no one cares. People actually care. It's so weird. So the conversation that happens around it, I think actually maybe is almost more important than the actual just like yeah. here, read the press release. Yeah. Which is kind of wild to think about. The social media does that work basically. You don't even have to do much <laughs> if you get the right people but that's the thing like if you get the right talent if you find the cool fashion people online send them the press release like they just want to create content they want to yeah. talk about it they yeah. want to engage and they're the ones with the most active communities that are going to comment and you can learn so much from that as a brand like see does research almost yeah. right i don't know it's crazy to think about um so what if you could in in a dream world what are like the changes you're hoping to see in the next couple of years? Oh, wow. Um, just the way brands adopt social media. So mm. as someone that reviews shows online, something that I always struggle with is if I don't get to go to the showroom, I can't actually see the details on the back of clothes. Sure, yeah. Because when you watch a runway show on YouTube, it's just the front. When you look at Vogue runway images, it's just the front. When they do the detail shots, it's still just yeah. the front so it's like the back doesn't exist of the clothes um so i always struggle with that because i'm always asking people what did the back look like people that went to the show were there any interesting things and it's almost like you don't see any of it online um, which is kind of strange yeah i don't know why if we're going to see the front why don't we see the back <laughs> True. so that's something that i hope definitely changes i also hope that that's such a basic thing by the way and you have like in these brands they have heads of social media, heads of image, art directors. And for some reason, almost every runway show without fail, there's never a shot of the back of the garment. And the back of the garment is actually really important for a lot of designers because they've done different things. They've done different techniques. They've changed or made the back of the garment very interesting. And you miss all of that context because a lot of the runaway shows just film the front of the body. There's no back perspective. Sometimes there is, but most of the time there isn't. And on Vogue Runway, it's very rare that on the detail shots, you get to see the actual back of the garments also. Um, so it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy that that's still not a thing. Like we want to see all of the garment, not just one side of it. You know, social media content creators are taken as seriously. Mm. Um, I mean, the content creators I know are very educated about fashion. They have like whole libraries. I have my own library as well. And people like rent books from my library. That's amazing. So yeah, it's just this whole thing of you have 
to do it one way and that way is the only way. I think, I hope it's something that changes and I hope perspectives around that change. Yeah, I think so. I think it's of like amazing importance. And I think in the world of editorial, I think people are really starting to catch on to like how important it is. So many magazines are thinking about social first ideas, um, really using like Instagram and TikTok primarily as ways of communicating to new audiences. Because I think especially with like streetwear, that started, you know, I want to say like 15 years ago. And the people that were 15 then are 30 now. Right. So it's also about like, how do you capture today's 15 year olds? And how do you speak to them, not just like the audience that you've built and grown over the years? So I think that's also very interesting. And I, I do think that's like where these heritage magazines and titles are really going to have to put in the work because Gen Z are spoiled for choice. There's so much content. And I think if you have a, a personality like yourself that you relate to and that you enjoy, you'd almost rather tune into your YouTube video than reading an article by someone that you have no context of who they are. And I, I do think we just need to start realizing that with younger people, like my sister is 19. She's probably never read anything I've ever written. <laughs> But she watches my TikToks religiously and she watches everything that I do on social media, reads the captions that I write, but she will never click into a link and read it. And I, I wrote something recently and I sent it to her and she read it and I was like, wow, she was like, that was so good, well researched, because she's now starting to get way more into fashion and is starting to, to read articles, to right. look into things. So I'm like, that is kind of the user behavior that is happening with social media and i think you know brands publications anyone really should take advantage of that like it's the entry point into this vast industry that's like a billion dollar industry but how do you what's the hook right. you know and that right. is that is the videos that is the content that is the social media personalities like yourself and i think they're the ones that are going to make the most change yeah but i think in the next couple of years like you say there needs to be change there. And I'm actually really looking forward to these next couple of seasons because I feel like now with Couture and the recent Marc Jacobs show, people are really excited about fashion again. And there are so many amazing conversations that are happening. So I'm hoping to see more of that on social media. And I'm hoping to see you in the front row very soon uh, in London, in Milan, Paris, all of the above. Thank you. Likewise, I'm hoping to see you at the front yeah. row of all the shows, I'll be on making the great content. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was really great speaking to you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your insight. I think you're amazing and you're such an amazing force in fashion. And I can't wait to see what you do and what's next for your journey. Okay, that was a really cool interview. It was really cool to watch that back because I actually haven't watched it back fully um, since we recorded it so many months ago. Um, so yeah, that was fun to watch. I think we recorded it at the start of this year because all the, all the episodes in the series were shot on the same day in the same studio for people that don't know. So like there was one episode I think with Martin Rose because I remember when Martin Rose came. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting episodes, actually, the whole season. Like, if you guys are interested, definitely watch season five. But yeah, it's very, very interesting where fashion is going and, you know, where things, how things are looking. Fashion is in a very, very interesting place, but I, I have a lot of hope for fashion. I definitely have a lot of hope. This YouTube channel runs on your support. If you want to support the channel, you can subscribe to my Patreon. You'll gain access to exclusive content that includes everything from my Patreon podcast, where I give a behind the scenes insight into the fashion industry, as well as a fashion book club, where I review my favorite fashion books. You can also check out my fashion ebook, which highlights the best fashion journalists to follow, definitions of common fashion terminology, and how to determine what a good source of fashion information is. The links to everything are in the description below. 